welcome back to this new creepy news episode. Today I wanted to share with you the case of Vera Page. It occurred decades ago, so let's give credit to the people who combined all the details and posted them through Wikipedia in order for us to learn about it. Cases like these take a lot of digging into old newspapers and reports, but it's one of those cases where a lot of information has been compiled to keep the story alive, of a young girl who lost her life in a brutal way without a perpetrator ever being charged. They did have one specific person of interest, but in the end it led nowhere. Some evidence seemed to suggest he was involved, but ultimately they had to let him go, and he died of natural causes in 1961. For this video I wanted to specifically go over the paragraphs detailing the events before and after Vera's murder, since the investigation into the potential suspect in question ultimately led nowhere. So let's get right into it. Now Vera Page was born on the 13th of April 1922 in Hammersmith, London, the only child born to Charles and Isabel Page. The Page family were working class. Her father was employed as a painter with Great Western Railways and her mother was a housewife. Vera had been described as a popular yet shy and well-behaved girl. To supplement the family income, Charles and Isabel occasionally allowed lodgers to reside in their home. Although these lodges were always either family members or individuals known to the family. In January 1931, the Page family moved from Chapel Road, Notting Hill, now known as St. Mark's Place, to a three-story house in nearby Blenheim, Crescent. The family did not occupy the whole house, but rooms on both the ground floor and basement. Other occupants who resided in the upper floors of this property included a middle-aged couple named Arthur and Annie Rush, who had lived in the property for approximately 20 years. Now, on the 14th of December 1931, Vera left her home at 22 Blenheim Crescent at 4.30 p.m. to walk approximately 50 yards to the home of her aunt, Minnie, who lived at number 70 in Blenheim Crescent. The purpose of this short journey was to collect two swimming certificates she had been awarded but had left with her aunt the previous day. When Vera had not returned home by 5.30pm, her father paid a visit to her aunt who informed him Vera had collected her swimming certificates and then left her home at approximately 4.45pm, intending to return home in time for her evening meal. Having first visited the homes of all Vera's friends and relatives in the hope his daughter may be with an acquaintance, Charles Page visited Nottingham Police Station to report Vera as missing at 10.25 p.m. Assisted by several friends and neighbors, Charles and Isabel continued their search for Vera throughout the evening and into the morning. The following day, Vera's physical description was circulated among local police and by the evening of the 15th of December, local media had been notified of her disappearance. Via extensive inquiries, investigators determined that at some time between 5 and 6 p.m. on the 14th of December, Vera had spoken with a school friend as she, Vera, had stood outside a chemist located at junction of Blenheim Crescent and Portobello Road, and that Vera had informed her friend of her intentions to purchase a soap dominoes on prominent display behind the window as a Christmas present for her parents. The friend had noted that Vera had been carrying an envelope in her hand which her aunt confirmed to investigators had contained her swimming certificates. Shortly after this brief conversation, the friend had left Vera standing in front of the chemist's window. No other verifiable sightings of the child, alone or in the company of any other individual, could be established after this time. Now, On the 16th of December, a milkman discovered Vera's body, laying in a patch of shrubbery in the front garden of 89 Addison Road, Kensington close to Holland Park and approximately one mile from her home. The perpetrator had made no serious efforts to conceal her body, beyond making a brief and rudimentary effort to throw handfuls of earth and leaves upon her remains. This fact led investigators to speculate she had likely been murdered close to the location of the discovery of her body and that the perpetrator either lived locally or held extensive geographical knowledge of the neighborhood. Furthermore, a worn section of ammonia-stained finger bandage was discovered to be lodged firmly against the inner elbow of her right arm. This evidence was only discovered when her body was moved from the crime scene to the mortuary. Approximately 40 hours had elapsed between the time Vera had last been seen alive and the discovery of her remains. Yet her body was not rigid and decomposition was relatively advanced. 
thus suggesting her body had been stored in a fairly warm environment between the time she had been seen alive and the discovery of her body. Moreover, it had rained heavily from 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. the previous day, and the climate was still generally moist and misty. Yet her clothing had absorbed very little moisture and solely in locations where her body had touched the soil at the location of her discovery, leading investigators to believe that the child's body could not have lain in a location where she was discovered for more than two hours. This opinion was corroborated by both an occupant of the house who informed investigators that the body had been in a patch of shrubbery before 7.50 a.m. She could not have failed to notice it, and the milkman who had made his routine delivery to the home at 5.30 a.m. in that morning was adamant that the body had not lain in this location upon his first visit to the premises. Now the child's body was examined by an eminent pathologist named Sir Bernard Spilsbury, who concluded that Vera had been raped and then manually strangled to death shortly after the last confirmed sighting of her alive. Her body bore superficial bruising and a welt mark located upon her neck had been inflicted via a ligature, although this injury had evidently occurred after death. He also determined that Vera had been deceased for an excess of 24 hours prior to the discovery of her body and that, as evidenced by the advanced state of decomposition of her body, given the time lapse between her disappearance and discovery, that for the vast majority of this time her body had lain in a warm environment. He also discovered traces of soot and coiled dust upon her face, plus spattered candle wax in two locations around her right shoulder, and three locations upon the shoulder of Vera's coat. Furthermore, he concurred with the initial police conclusion that the section of ammonia-stained finger bandage found lodged against her inner elbow had likely dislodged from the hand of her murderer as he had deposited her body at the crime scene. The candle wax itself was subsequently discovered to be of a different consistency to all candles with Vera's own home. The consistency of the candle wax discovered upon her clothing, plus the evident coil dust, led Spilsbury to the conclusion that the girl's body had been lightly hidden in either a coal shed or cellar prior to her body being discarded at Addison Road, and that this shed or cellar must likely have no electric light as evidenced by the presence of the candle wax also found upon her clothing. Now it's also these details where they figured out one prime suspect and they checked the bandages that he had in his home and the candles. They could link it to this crime to a certain extent, but then ultimately they had to dismiss all of it because after even further investigation on the bandages, they realized they were not the same brand. But then the police also admitted before they were investigating this perpetrator's home, they told him that they suspected him of being the murderer and that they were suspicious of the bandages he had at his home. So they came to the conclusion that he probably did, discarded the evidence, potentially, before they made their investigation. That's where the police admitted they messed it all up because ultimately this perpetrator's name that they suspected of killing her was Percy Rush. But at the end of the day, he was let go and died of natural causes, as I mentioned at the intro of the video. But the whole investigation into him goes back and forth on these details that seem to go nowhere in the end. Now, they did have a little bit more information concerning the investigation of Vera's murder itself. And they said the following. It caused extensive public indignation and police mounted an intense operation to apprehend her murderer conducting extensive door-to-door -door inquiries throughout the vicinity of her disappearance and discovery and launching extensive media appeals to the public for information to insist in their inquiries. Over 1,000 people would be formally questioned in relation to the abduction and murder of Vera Page and several thousand witness statements obtained by police throughout their subsequent inquiries. As Vera was a shy child, investigators theorized she had likely been abducted and murdered by an individual she had known and trusted, and that this individual had lured her to a warm room where he had proceeded to rape and murder her before stowing her body in a coil cellar, as indicated by the extensive coil dust upon her clothes. This individual had subsequently retrieved her body from the coil cellar at or shortly before dawn on the 16th of December and proceeded to transport her body to Addison Road, inadvertently removing the finger bandage from his little finger as he removed his hands from beneath the child's arms. 
A Mrs. Margaret Key informed investigators that at approximately 6.40 a.m. on the 16th of December, she had observed an individual whose physical appearance fit that of a local man named Percy Orlando Rush, pushing a wheelbarrow laden with a large bundle covered with a distinctive red tablecloth with a knitted fringe walking in the direction of Addison Road. The day following the discovery of her body, a woman living close to Addison Road named Kathleen Short brought the child's red Barrett to the Nottingham Police Station, stating she had found the item at approximately 9.30 p.m. the previous evening at a location investigators noted was quite close to where she had last been seen alive. This barrette was identified by Charles and Isabel Page as belonging to their daughter and was noted to smell of paraffin, although this odor may have been caused by the woman initially storing the barrette beneath a sink in her cellary. The woman also informed investigators that close to the scene of her discovery, she had also located several sections of torn paper, which she had collected and discarded, and a section of candle, which she had herself used, then also discarded. By the 21st of December, police inquiries had also produced an eyewitness who stated that on the morning of the discovery of Vera's body, the door to a coil shed close to Edison Road had been left unlocked and ajar, when on all other dates it would invariably have been closed and locked. The coil cellar in question, located close to the house on Edison Road where Vera's body was discovered, had no electric light, giving credibility to Sir Bernard Spilsbury theory that the child had either been murdered and or her body stored in a basement or coil cellar with no electric light, and that her murder had likely illuminated the scene via candlelight. Investigators gave strong support to the theory the girl's body had been temporarily concealed in the cellar after her murder, and then transported via a wheelbarrow to the location of her subsequent discovery. As you can see, it's quite a bizarre case, and who knows, it seems they really zoomed in on this person named Percy Rush, but at the end of the day he wasn't charged, so this is basically an unsolved murder case of a very young girl. She was only 10 years old at the time she died on the 14th of December 1931, which is almost 100 years ago by now. Regardless of that, I still wanted to share her story through Creepy News so more people can at least know about it. We hope the victim is resting in peace and you never know, they might find the perpetrator if they're really on the case still, but sometimes, as time ticks on, perhaps less and less resources are aimed at it anyway, so it might never be solved in the end. With that being said, if you're new to this channel, consider subscribing to receive new creepy news cases on a regular basis. Have sweet dreams.